This is an excellent lecture by Gordon Higginson on spiritual healing. It was recorded on the 7th of April 1975 and it runs for 1 hour 15 minutes. Many people are not aware that Gordon Higginson was an excellent healer and he did regular healing at Longton Spiritualist Church as well as running courses on healing elsewhere. In this lecture Gordon gives advice and guidance on spiritual healing. He talks about the simplicity of healing and the need to keep it natural. He stresses the need to attune to spirit and the importance of love. He also discusses healing as service and the importance of prayer. Finally, he talks about the importance of diet and fasting to both healing and our spiritual development, then answers a number of questions on healing. The recording is of very good quality and well worth a listen for anyone interested in spiritual healing. I'm grateful to Eric Williams for recording it. I do hope you enjoy it and please feel free to share. I just uh, dealt very much with the way in which healing works, or how it should work, and the importance that healing should be developed. That is, that we should develop um, people to be healers, just as we develop people to be mediums. Because healing, after all, is mediumship. It is a cooperation um, between those that are going to be attracted to you um, and um, to use you as an instrument for healing or as a medium of healing. So therefore, we have to understand what it is that we can do uh, to help this power and also to help um, the spirit people that are going to work with us. I want to point out very much that one of the great centers that is used in mediumship is the solar plexus. In the past, um, you would have mediums that would say, now I'm going to give you a demonstration for once, and will the gentleman please uh, unfold their arms? This was very often what mediums said, and um, they were quite right, really, because uh, they were mediums that were called impressionable mediums, uh, that were using the solar plexus as uh, the form of mediumship. They were concentrating very much upon people and gathering the impressions. It was because the development of mediums in those days uh, was rather haphazard, in a way that there were very few people that knew uh, how mediumship functioned. And it was because of that, they found they had this gift to be able to see, but they didn't know how it worked. And therefore, they realized that when a person uh, did that, they found it difficult uh, to be able to get the contact uh, and from a person that didn't do that. So they began to say, oh, well, will you please look on your arms? I feel so much happier and better when I'm demonstrating. Uh, so we gathered, or they gathered, that they must have a solar plexus open. Now, that is, now you realize it wasn't a lot of nonsense. It was a question that we learn how to do it and realize that barriers, uh, whether it's your arms like this or whether it isn't, really make no difference to mediumship. But unless you know that and you develop yourself to be able to tap into it um, without, um, um, in other words, without um, realizing that, um, uh, that, that you are doing it, and therefore a barrier is going to help you, we realize that barriers, you know, there are such things as barriers. With rather a peculiar exception, it, it's always puzzled me uh, that in the churches, when people are building rostrums, they always build something for people to hold their hands on. And um, I can never understand this, uh, that mediums would stand behind a barrier, but they never liked people that they were demonstrating to, to have any barrier in front of them. And it rather puzzled me. And then I realized that um, they themselves wanted protection, in other words. They felt that if they were behind something, uh, it, it gave them confidence. And I spoke to many mediums because, uh, you know, I've been brought up in spiritualism, and um, when I was a little boy, 12 or 13, besides me, I used to have to play to the church. So I got to know all mediums. And I used to ask the same questions about how do you have this on mediumship work? And I got most peculiar answers, but nevertheless, I got some answers. And it wasn't until I began to think for myself that I realized that some of the answers were quite good. It was a question that they just 
explain to you what they'd come up against, and they didn't understand why. Well, when I had our church done, I became the president, I ripped out the front of the platform because I, I thought, well, if we're going to get needed to plop in, let us for heaven's sake, give them an opportunity, let's get rid of all these barriers. And so I had it all ripped out. And it was amazing how many meetings came about all these things, and I can't possibly work on that platform because I have nothing in front of me. I must have something in front of me. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but you won't be able to have anything in front of you because it's all gone and uh, you can't do anything about it. And we had several mediums that couldn't work. They just couldn't work. They said they were sorry. And halfway through the demonstration, they said, I'm sorry, I can't go on. They got so used to doing, holding something in front of them, they developed themselves to work like that. And immediately you took that from them, they couldn't do a thing. Now, mediums that have developed, uh, I think the correct method, will always say, dear, please get rid of this. See, I don't want it. I don't want anything in front of it at all. And uh, it was because they were able to use their, their gift properly and work in cooperation with the spirit world without barriers, because you shouldn't need anything to sort of give you confidence. You learn to use your mind. Now, I brought that up, actually, because you can develop your gifts to rely on certain things that you don't really need at all. See, mediumship doesn't need anything. No crutches, no barriers. It doesn't need anything at all. Mediumship is completely natural. Therefore, it should be developed in a natural way. So when you start off, don't start off ever with gimmicks. Throw them out through the window. Get rid of them. Treat everything in a natural way. Now, I have emphasized that because going round the churches, which I do, and very often going in when people are doing healing, one thing I notice is that if I was a stranger going in for the first time, I would be very worried about what I see and I'd probably go away after the first time and not go back. Because I would think that I was in doing it wrong. For example, some people want to wear the curtains drawn and, uh, you know, dark and work only with the small lights. And I think that in itself uh, would unnerve the person that's going to come for the first time. I think that you need to throw everything open so that everybody sees that it's quite light and that um, there are no sort of weirdness going to happen. <coughs> and the other thing is that I don't believe that people should go in trance unless their trance is explained to the people that are going to come for healing for the first time. Because people are always afraid of trance unless they know what it's all about. Now I know you're going to say to me, well you have um, um, various people who are in trance, but when you see these people, they are perfectly natural. In fact, you wouldn't even recognize that they were in trance at all. And this is one of the peculiar things that happens in mediumship. You can very often um, find a person developing trance, and as they develop it, it becomes so natural and so easy uh, that except for the manner by which they do their work, you wouldn't think that they were in trance at all. It's just as though they're working uh, uh, just with their eyes closed, or so, even sometimes I think with their eyes open. I can't understand that, but I mean, the eyes are closed normally, and they're doing their work um, quite naturally. And when they speak, except perhaps for a little change in the voice, uh, it seems to be very much like the medium. And that is because of the continual <coughs> use of the spirit that doesn't bother to change the personality, but is only interested in doing two things. One, using the body in a perfectly natural way, and putting out part of the brain, and using everything else of the medium. So that if you see that, don't ever think that because it seems so much like the medium, 
that the reader is not in trance. Remember that trance is only an hypnosis. It is not something whereby it is complete obsession or possession, whatever you want to call it. It is merely an overshadowing. The deeper the trance means that they keep more control over the brain. Now you must recognize that and you must understand it or else you'll never uh, ever be able to go into trance yourself because you'll always doubt it and you'll always wonder, you know, what it's all about. Trance is a very light thing. The, the, it's deep only when they take over the body for specific purposes. But a guide can learn how to come to a medium, and especially in healing, when they take the patient, the, the medium for a long time, that they can take over, and they are so natural that you can't tell that they're in trance. Now there is the difference between the type of trance that people have to, ah, oh, I know, up goes their arms and they give the Indian salute and all sorts of things. <laughs> and to me, it's a gimmick, you see. I, I don't believe the spirit. I don't believe it at all. The spirit world wants everything perfectly natural. And there's no need for it. Because the spirit world can use you just as simply and as naturally and as easily without letting you even believe that they're even there. Now that's how you should develop it. So that anybody that comes in to you doesn't see a great change in you that might be frightening, but will see a natural, normal way. Now you must go back again, of course, to um, when Jesus himself, um, if you remember, uh, took trance. And all he did was to go to sleep. He used to close his eyes and he used to just go to sleep. And he was always looked as though he was asleep. And that was right. Absolutely right. You hear the story in the Bible, don't you, of where they could hear the deep breathing. They could hear the deep breathing. But we now know that when there is someone coming close to you from the other side, the first thing that they do is to take over the breathing. They have to learn how to cooperate with you so that they can, in other words, take over the heart to lower it down because they've got to control that so that you, they bring you down from this state of where you are going at the normal speed uh, to the below speed to slow down, because all trance states means that the body has to be put into a slower pace. You slow it down, so you get your breathing much lower. And then you find that they bring it back to the normal stage. So that you'll always find that. And if it is that you find your breathing going, never get excited. I'm saying this to you because if you're going to heal, you'll find yourself sometimes being taken over by the Spirit. And especially if you have got into that wonderful sort of relationship with the other side, of when you are really deep into what I call this wonderful deep state of when you are healing, you'll find that you will have attracted to yourself someone on the other side. And all at once, you will find this presence coming. And the first thing that happens is your heart beats, you see. That's the first thing they go for. They must go for that. We know that through practical experience, mediums do. That's the first reaction that you get. And your breathing starts to go. Now you very often get this, but instead of realizing that they should now control their breathing, because that, that's how they're going to help. They're going to help. And it's wrong. That's doing harm and not good. For what you get, if, you're, if it's been done correctly, is that the spirit is coming and they're slowing your breathing. But your reaction is to go against it. And therefore you get... And it's wrong. You can't, you can't do it that way. What you have to do is to realize it's happening and you go calm. That's the time to go calm. And so, as you're doing your healing, you can't do it. You allow yourself just to go calmly. 
so that you are controlling your breathing very slowly and very calmly. Now once you've done that, and that's calmly done, the spirit world is then taking over the other part. So that there are two things you must watch. One, that when you are healing, and you are losing yourself in your healing, it is possible that you will attract to yourself closer the one that is working with you from the other side, and you will get a reaction. You will feel differently. But because you know it's happening, you think that you, you think you're helping them by doing that, and you're not. You're doing the reverse. The spirit people are asking you to be calm. And they are then controlling your breathing and your heart. And you slow it down and remain calm. Not excited. And then the other thing you find is someone says, Oh, come along, friend. Yes, you're coming. I can see you, friend. <laughs> Only because they've heard the breathing happening, you see. And that's the greatest danger of all. That causes more harm than anything I know. Because you're telling the, the person that's under, who's in that terribly hypnotic stage of where they'll do precisely what you're asking them to do. And it's not for you to do it. Trance is the taking over of the spirit, not the earth. Your voice will interfere with what is taking place on the other side. You leave it alone. Unless you see it going wrong. And then you take over and bring them back to themselves. Now I say that because in healing, especially, you are dealing with people that are inexperienced. It's one of the greatest dangers, I find, that many people that go into the healing have never even sat in a development class. And they don't know what mediumship is all about. And I believe that they should go through the same process as when you're developing mediumship, as to develop healing. Why is healing a part? Healing is not a part. Healing is a gift of mediumship. And therefore, it should be developed correctly and properly. For people to come along, which they do, and say, oh yes, I can heal, we have to be very careful. When we're talking about the gift of healing and the spiritual healing, then we must always bear in mind that we must treat it as a spiritual gift. And if you are going to be attracted to the spirit world, you must learn how to cooperate with them. And you will come into these states, of which I have told you, of where people begin to do this, it is quite natural for it to happen, but it should be treated naturally, because if I was a person, a patient coming for healing for the first time, and someone started to sort of make passes and, and shake me to death, I'd be terrified. I'd be <coughs> more ill than when I came in, because I should be worried to death of what was taking place. Now, if you remember the whole of the time that it is a natural, and the more natural you give it, the greater is going to be the response from your patient, the greater will be your results, because you are, first of all, they'll be more confident in you, and that you are treating it so naturally, they say, oh, I didn't expect it to be like this. I thought it was going to be different. Because you must remember in healing that you are dealing with Roman Catholics, with Baptists, with all kinds of people. You'll have come to you people of every religion. And you've got to be able to show them that spiritualism is natural. And that they go away, not when they come to you with any preconceived idea that they're going to have spirits everywhere, and go away and say, well, it was nothing like that at all. In fact, it was quite just like going into a surgery and being prayed for, which was lovely, and I felt the warmth and the glow. Oh, I'm going again because it was so lovely. And that's when the healing starts. Not always at that first time, but what goes on afterwards. And that's what you always have to bear in mind. Now, natural must be all this. Now, I said to you that the solar plexus will work. And this is where that you have to be rather careful in diagnosis. Because the diet, it means that you will feel, and after all, uh, the solar plexus is that part 
that is used by all mediumship, that, through to the mind, are the two important parts that are used by the spirit in all mediumship. When we gather this, we realize that immediately you take a person's hand, or immediately you contact someone, you are in touch with them. We talk about soul wise, don't we? I think we should talk about it. If, like, solar plexus, we are meeting them on a level of emotion. A person who comes to you sick is sick not only physically, but emotionally, spiritually, um, because their mind has accepted it for their illness. And therefore, you will easily be able to sense it and feel it and become aware of it. When you are healing, you are bound to pick up aches and pains. But if you start off, you have to be rather careful about this. Because you start off by saying, you've got a pain in your neck. And you say, well, I am. You've got a pain in your elbow, and you are. But don't forget that you are sometimes dealing with patients who have got pains everywhere. And if you're not very careful, you'll have a pain in your head, to your foot, to your arm, to your eyes. You'll have every illness that there is. Because you're not only tapping in to their emotion, but also to them. And they're telling you what they want to tell them. And that isn't diagnosis. That has nothing to do with diagnosis. You're merely doing like people come for a message. And if you're not very careful as a medium, you'll tell them exactly what they want you to tell them. Because they're willing you to tell them what they want you to tell them. It's exactly the same with diagnosis. You can pick it up and they'll say, yes, that's quite right. Yes, oh, I have pains all across here. Yes, and, and my back, yes. And it goes right down my back. And you say, yes, that's right, I can feel that in my back. Now, you have to remember, you picked it up. But is it correct? Is it correct? All right, give them that experience. But don't start that point to now, because you will find that as you go along, the greater intelligence will say, yes, this person's sick, but don't take a notice read of all these extra pains that she's got, or he's got. Because, I mean, men are just as bad as ladies, they come quite often, and they've got so many illnesses that you wonder, are they walking about? Now, some are genuine, but quite a lot aren't. I'm not saying they don't feel pain. I can go along now with my mind, like you can, and say, oh, my leg, oh, it is giving me a lot of trouble. And you go along like that. And before you know where you are, you're, you're living. Because, you see, your mind is divided into two sections. Your conscious mind and your subconscious. Now, once you have convinced yourself that you have got something wrong with your leg, it goes out of your conscious mind into your subconscious. And that means that it has become part of you. And your emotion then takes that over, and you develop your illness. That's how you're made. You can't, do, you can't stop it. And you can't hold everything in your mind, but once you have convinced yourself that you have got it, it's the devil of a job to remove it. Devil of a job to remove it. Because it's gone into your subconscious and accepted as a fact. Because that's why you've got a subconscious mind. And immediately something up comes out of the subconscious. The You're quite right. I've got a pain. Oh, and do you know if you haven't have mentioned it until you've mentioned it? Oh, well, now it's come. You see, how did you have it? When you were spoken to a person, you said, you know, isn't it funny? As I'm talking to you, I got a pain in my back. Well, do you know, isn't that funny? I haven't felt it for weeks. And now it's stopped. Why? Because it is in the subconscious mind. And by tapping into them, you have created from the subconscious mind into the conscious mind. And consequently, they'll get the pain. And sometimes they won't get it. I've had them myself. I have said to a case, it's strange, you know. I thought the throat trouble was with your back. But you know, I have to have trouble with your back. The following week, they'll come back. You were marvelous. You know, you told me I was going to have back trouble, and I had it. <laughs> it just happens. Because you are dealing with people that are sick. They're ill, and they need help. But we have to be very careful about it. And we have to realize that lots of people want to be ill. I have a patient that I deal with every Tuesday. And she comes to me, and she's been coming for ages, and I still let her come to me. And uh, I have to 
put her on this list and I take her back. As we come into Victor Gast, and I, she's had every illness as possible. I never know what illness she's going to come to me with what next week. Because I cure of one thing and she develops another. And I immediately, and um, um, the art receptionist, uh, who's very good, will say, um, Will she be here next week? And I say, yes, but I think she'll come with a headache next week, and I will see. And lo and behold, she will. She'll come with a headache. <laughs> I'm absolutely marvelous, Miss Ingerson. It's all cleared up. Oh, my head. And then you clear that time, she says, it's, it's gone in my ears. You know? It's all in my ears. And the poor woman psychologically wants to be ill, you see. And she realizes that you, you know, you get it out of her mind, but she wants to be ill. And she doesn't want to be very better. And you have people come to you, you have deaf people that come to you. And they don't realise it, but they don't always want to get their hearing back. They don't always want their hearing to come back. There are lots of people. I know a young man now that has been deaf for a long time. And uh, he happened to hear once noise. And he came back to follow me and said, Mr. Hingson, I don't want to hear. I love my silent realm. It's amazing, isn't it? Here we are, we would hate it. But here is a person that wants their own silent realm. And when they heard some of the noise that we had to listen to, it nearly drove them mad. They couldn't stand it. They'd been so used to a silent world. And you will have people like that, that just don't want to. They're quite happy to be as they are. And you know just as well as I do, you have to do in, oh, well, men, I suppose, most of the women, you can talk, and if they don't want to hear you, they won't hear you. But you whisper something, and they want to hear you. And they'll say, I heard that. I heard that. Because it's appalling. And you know, you must always remember that you can switch on, and you can switch off. If you don't want to hear, you won't hear. You can have the most marvelous hearing, but you can train yourself. Now, how do you do it? Because you've got to learn to do it. You can't hear it. There's somebody else behind you chattering away. You've got to learn to be able to hear. One thing I can't stand is noise. If I'm hearing, hearing, I just, it, I, I've never liked it because I believe that everything should be calm. Because you're dealing with something very fine that's got to work, and very often at some particular moment when you feel it's there, crash or someone bangs the door. Oh God. You know, it infuriates me because very often you just need that absolute moment of perhaps just when it's working and you could just carry on in that one little moment when you clear the whole thing, it clicks into place and something happens and distracts the whole thing. And that's always there. I think you should have perfect partners. I'm not talking about not having music. I think music. He's going to play, and will play, one of the greatest parts of healing, especially with tumor, and especially with spastics. Spastics, I am quite convinced, will ultimately be cured by sound and by music. Because these two things, you'll find with a child that if they're a spastic, that you can train them to do things to music that you can't train them to do with your voice. And you'll find, we have a, a girl that comes to us, and I put on music, I take her, and uh, when I do, she can move her arms to the music perfectly, take the music off, and tell to move her arms. She doesn't do it at all. She hasn't got into the rhythm of it. And once you can keep them in there, I suppose the same with, with swimming, isn't it? You, you put them into water and uh, let them swim, they can swim, and they can get movement in their arms. And music is the same. We've got to learn a lot about this, that we do need at times music, and we need a certain type of music uh, that will click in, so that you get people that are working with this and get rid of them. Because why? Because, you see, we are functioning in rhythm. <coughs> now, let's have a look first to prove that. Do you think, quite honestly, you are just a mess, you know, like that. You're not. You're the most beautiful. I keep on telling everyone that beautiful. And I wish everyone would believe it. 
If you only believe you're beautiful, it's you are beautiful. But believe it, you see. Just don't say, oh, yes, I'm beautiful. Um, uh, well, I'm not. I'm beautiful, you see. And you are beautiful. Everybody's beautiful. Because you all have a rhythm. You're all in rhythm. You're all in sound. You see. The whole of the universe is to a marvelous sound. And we're all in rhythm with it. When you're ill, you're not in rhythm. That's why you're ill. You're not in rhythm to this. That's why you get all these illnesses come to you. They're all sounding different. Everyone is out of rhythm. And, but when you see yourself as you are in rhythm with the universe, you've got all the in-spiritual power that's coming into you that's glowing with color. And you've got all your earthly power from the aesthetic coming in. You see, you've got everything moving out and moving in. And isn't it so? You see, if we are in tune with the whole universe of which we are, we are linked with everything that's moving with the universe. And it's all making one great, wonderful sound. And the things that are not in rhythm with it are out of tune, are sick. The body is out of rhythm. That is where you're able to get, uns when we say unspiritual people, they may have a perfect body, I know someone, I know them quite well. They have the most perfect body. They spend more time on their body uh, uh, and how to get a body. And their body is in rhythm. But the most discordant note is that their mind and their soul and their spirit is out of rhythm. And therefore you get a terrible discord. And you get this unspiritual, arrogant veil. And it, to me, until you've got them both, you'll never get anything, get anywhere. You can have the most perfect body, but if your spirit is out, it's no use. Now you can get the reverse. And you can get a most wonderful spiritual person with a body that's out of rhythm. But if you can hear and tap in, it, the body, which is important, is secondary. You see, it isn't the important body. And although we have to look after our body, so we keep it, it is not the body that is in tune with the whole of the spirit. It is only in tune with the earth, because that's where the etheric comes in. Now, if you want to get the real in tune, you must get first the spirit right, the spiritual side right, and then bring up the other. So that you can, and a gentleman said to me, uh, I think it was a gentleman or a lady yesterday, or both, can a person that's sick heal? And the answer is yes. Because healing has nothing to do with the body. It's to do with the spirit. And therefore, it doesn't matter how sick a person can be. For example, Nurse Roberts is um, a medium. And she's got a very sick body. But I think that she could do more healing and not affect her in her own way, in a spiritual way, than many so called healers. Because you're dealing with a spiritual power. And it's the same with other people. You see, you don't heal with your body, you are healing with your spirit. You are linking yourself up with a spiritual sound. And that's pouring into the body. You get that right first. And then the other comes up. The other comes up. Now I think here, what I wanted to do this morning was to tell you, A, you're beautiful, <laughs> two, that there is more to healing than what you realize, because you must realize that you as a healer are not saying, oh yes, I want Heal. Oh yes, I'm going, I've got this power and I'll give it to you. It's more than that. It is the most marvelous, the most beautiful, because you yourself have got to do everything you can to link with the great rhythm of spiritual life. And that is, you've got to do that. Oh, anybody can give them their logic. You can take a person's hand and say, you're not very, very well, I can't do it. What am I giving? 
Well, I'm giving them a bit of bodily magnetism and it'll help them for a while, but they'll be it'll go all right for an hour, but an hour later they won't be so good. You need to do that. That's the easiest thing in the world. You've only got to have somebody come in and out, and they will be so full of vitality, so full, and you'll feel it. God, I wish they'd go. <laughs> because all the vitality is there. And you have to come to yes. And when they've gone, you go, oh. <laughs> oh, thank God they've gone. You see what I mean? And that is a physical bodily mechanism. While it's there, everybody's pepping around, you know, the walking, everybody, oh yes, what's going on? You know, and everybody's going around, they've got this. They are, that's animal magnetism, you see. And they've got it. And you can put the same thing into the physical body. You can put it to a person, you can give it to a person. It doesn't last, you see. Because it's purely physical. We're not dealing with the physical. We are dealing with the spiritual. And the idea is rhythm, music, harmony, spiritual thought. We are dealing with the within all the time. And we've got to learn how to capture those levels and to raise ourselves up onto this level of being in tune with the whole of the universal mind. And God. I keep on bringing this back to us because God is so important. The more we can love God, the more we can love ourselves. And if you think that you are not lovely, how can you love yourself? It's impossible. And you've got to love yourself. People say to me, but isn't that selfish for things to love yourself? <coughs> is it? I can't see how it is. If you love, if there's something wrong with you that you can't love yourself, but I think you've got to put it right until you do. All of us have something wrong with us. But after all, if we realize how important we are, and how wonderful we can be, and how lovely we can be, and how we can raise ourselves up until we, isn't it lovely? Isn't it wonderful to be alive? Isn't it marvelous to feel that I have been chosen spiritually to play a part. That's loving. And then you can turn that love like that until you can love people, love them all, and try to understand them. And when you are healing more than anything else, far more, because you are dealing with that side of people that needs that more than anything else. You talk of spiritual healing. Then let us remember that spiritual healing is spiritual healing. And therefore we must be more spiritual and more lovely and more aware and try always to love. You can never start healing with hate in your heart. You can't start. You can't start with, so, oh, I don't know why I've come here today. Anyway, I'll do my job. Mrs. So, so I'm not coming anymore. Oh, God. Don't you hear this so often? And it's so sad to me. Because if you you shouldn't be there if you're like that. The door should be locked against you until you can <coughs> come in and feel this is heaven. I come because it's heaven. Then it works. Then it works. And once we can start to realize what we are dealing with and how to cope with it, the better. Now let's have a look. First, of what we should do and how we should do it. Let him sit here. We've got a lady sitting in a chair of that wants to be a human. And I, I mean, I'm saying it with this. And um, she has first the urge to be old. Probably, for all sorts of reasons. We'll accept she wants to be We are going here to remember that the body is not important. Your body is your house, and you've got to always look after your home, your house, not your home, your house. So therefore you keep it clean, don't you? You've got to keep it clean. And you've got to keep it healthy, so that it's in harmony uh, with the world. Yeah. So therefore, it is your, you have to learn how to do it. Whichever way you do it, it doesn't matter. It's got to be kept healthy. 
But you have something inside you that's far more beautiful than that. You have, first of all, the gift of life, which you are living. You can see, you can hear, you can feel, you can touch. You are now an immortal. You are spirit. You are part of God. That you must understand. Because you realize then that though the body is important, it's the house in which we've got to live, it's got to help us to remain here, functioning in this dimension of life. And therefore, it is our responsibility. So the responsibility of the body is entirely yours. Nothing to do with the spirit world, yours. You are here to God. But within it is the bread of life, which is God. You are in tune with the whole of life through the, through the universal mind so that you are here in this conscious state. Now you've got to understand that every person is going to deal with spiritual things must understand their relationship to the whole. And now we come to the part, I want to be able to help other people. You can't help them physically by your physical body, except to give them a little bit of animal mix if they require it. But you can deal with them spiritually because you are in tune with a spiritual mind. Because you are giving yourself in service to God. And therefore you must realize there are two things you've got to learn. One, you must feel for people emotionally so that you can feel for them. And you can't give with words. You see, you can talk to a person that will help them mentally, perhaps, but you've got to deal with the person on a spiritual level. And therefore, you've got to learn the saying to a person, I love you, is not like feeling that love. Now, which is the greater? To tell a person, I love you, or say to a person that comes to your presence, you know, I always feel when I come to you, I always feel better. I like being in your presence. I always feel better when I've been even close to you. Now, which is it? Of course it is. Because that's coming from here, you see. That's your emotion. That's the way in which you feel. So you are pouring out love, which is really going to work. All the words in the world. I mean, after all, you go to a doctor, don't you? And the doctor says to you, where are the aches and pain? And oh, yes. And then, well, here's your prescription. You go, I don't know why I go to the doctor. He says the same old thing every time I go. Now, how many times do you hear that, you see? You must remember, a doctor can only tell you what you tell him or her, you see. And they can only come to a diagnosis after you've told them everything that they, and they assume they have noticed. So they give you a drug to tie you over. Now, when you go to a meeting, you don't expect them to just give you words. Of course a few words always help now and then. But what they expect is for something to happen. So you don't give them a drug and say, you take this. You give them something far more important than that. Because you're going to pour out to them a spiritual thing that's going to pour into them and is going to vibrate through them and link them up with the universal mind spiritually that will eventually help them physically. Because their mind will then be capable of being able to understand what it couldn't understand before. So we are dealing with spiritual things. So you've got to learn, which I said yesterday, to love. There's nothing worse than going to a person, I don't know how you go, one doctor's extremely nice, and you always say, he's got a marvelous bedside manner. I like going because he's so nice to me. You go to another doctor, maybe an absolute marvelous doctor, so you go, what's the matter with you? Oh, go on, you know, it's not the matter with you also. God, there's no way to go to him or <laughs> He may be an absolute marvellous specialist, but, and marvellous, but you hate going. In fact, many people say, I just don't like going to our doctor, because he, he's so irritable, and he's so, you know, he's a marvellous doctor, but oh, he is so irritable. You know, you get that all the time. But we realise, of course, they're dealing with all sorts of people. Now, you get the same things with healers. You go to people and say, you know, 
I don't get on with that, he and I. We're not in tune with one another, you see. We're not in repo with one another. And you think to yourself, well, I can understand that, because we have about 20 to 25 healers in our church. And certain people are marvelous with certain people, but they're dreadful with another. Absolutely awful. And although they're good healers, you know you've got to take that patient away from them. Because they'll never do any good. They're too, you know, they, they just haven't got it. And I don't see how you can be nice with one and not nice with another. You see. I just don't see that. I think we've got to learn to treat everybody the same. No matter what they <coughs> intend or how irritable they are. And that is because you hear that's the part that works. When you are going to feel for love, love, emotion, hate, enmity, jealousy, is all part of the nervous system. It's all part of that. That is the seat of emotion. And therefore, that is the one that operates. So therefore, you must realize that when you're in tune with a person, you should be in tune with them here as well. Emotionally. And then you have to use your mind to lift it up, raise yourself spiritually onto a high level. Choose yourself in, if you know who they are, to those that work with you. And then take them to God in prayer. The meeting point is prayer. Is prayer. And you don't ever say, now we're going to say, our Father who art in heaven, all hallowed be thy name. Prayer is yours. You must pray. And to pray silently is one. You can have 30 patients, but there are 30 prayers. They can be the same prayer, but you must have the same feeling as you are dealing with that patient as you did with the first. No matter which patient it is, that earnest prayer. I always use the same prayer. I link every patient up quietly over a few seconds with God. But I know that we cannot do anything without God. And then we meet God and the power together. And you can either do it from behind or in front. Doesn't matter. Now, you say, well, how can I meet a patient here? You see, I can turn my back. And I can begin to feel for a person out there, and I can reach them with my solar plexus, whether I'm looking at them or not. You don't have to look at a person, same as support. You can work with it. You work with it by realizing this is a sense of emotion. And I said yesterday, it's like sending a color. You don't send a color, you create. You create it with what it is by putting your mind in harmony so that you are vibrating to that color. And you don't think of it, you create the condition that forms the color. And one of the greatest colors, of course, and people always argue about this, and I, I think, well, people, let, sorry, people argue um, about what they want to do. One of the great colors of emotion, of course, is pink. You know this by child, uh, any clairvoyant knows it, because when you have a child that comes to you, and if you do um, namings, um, one of the most beautiful things is to see a child. If a child is not bathed in pink, that child has not come into this world because of love. You can always see it. Pink is the color of love. It's the color of emotion. And a child always that's brought to a church should always be bathed in pink. It means the child is loved. And you get lots of children that are nowhere near the pink color. And you know, I always love those children more than another. Sometimes a child needs more love than another because they haven't got it from their parents. What about the gold? Well, you see, you're dealing with an entire different thing. Love is the color of pink. That means that the child has been born with love. The child was wanted, the child was loved. And that child knows it. From the instant the child is brought into the world, the child responds only to love. 
That's why this idea, you know, I don't believe nurses. I, I, I argue, and I've got into more trouble over this with my family than anything I know. I don't like children pushed away into prams. I think children should be loved and held close to their parents. I'm always picking up babies. I can't help it because I know that they need love. And today, you have to push them outside in a pram, and pack them up and push them outside. I can't stand it. It worries me today. Because I know, you see, I have so many children. I do so many things. And I've seen this gorgeous pink with children. I've always said, this child is loved. It doesn't need anything else. Love is the key to create, to bring children to the world. And you always find that with children, of course there are children that probably want a lot of love. You must understand that sometimes they do. And some children want it more than another. There are reasons why. But I think that we should hold them close to us and love them. You see. Uh, just hold them with love. Because they, they haven't get love. Or they need it. They want to be loved. You see. They want it. And you've got to give it to them. I know that there are times when you've got to put them outside, and of course it's nice, you know, for them to be outside. But I was always in trouble with our little boy, not my little boy, but my least little boy, because uh, he used to go out into the garden, and he used to love it. But every time I used to come, I used to take him out of the pram and walk around with him. And I, and I got into such trouble about this, <laughs> because this wasn't a thing to do. Uh, and of course, it's no arguing, you just have to put them back. But the point is that I do think a child, a child does need love. When we're touching other colours, you see, we must be rather careful because I'm not here to talk about colours. But gold, of course, is the colour of wisdom. That's why we always saw around the prophets, always around the prophets, they always say that they saw the bright light. It's not correct. The halo light, which is the, the gold light, is the gold light of wisdom. And that is the color whereby you people that are wise, like the wise men and the wise people today, if you look at them, you'll always find this halo, which is always gold, the most gorgeous color of gold. You always find the gold color always up in the head, never down here. There's never looking for gold down there, you'll never find it. Well, it couldn't be down there. It doesn't belong there. It's a mental colour, you see. It's the colour of wisdom. Therefore, it must come around the head. And if you can create that, you're a very wise person. It's a lovely colour to see, but not very often to see. It never goes anywhere else. You can't have it anywhere else. It's always going to come up here. Um, but that is the colour. Now, you will get that in children. Um, not very often, but <coughs> you will get a child that's destined, perhaps, for um, great things. Um, people that will play a part in life and play a very great part. Um, and that is, of course, if one believes also in reincarnation, and don't bring me into that, please, okay, so, uh, that you will get this colour that will come. And uh, it has been seen with children, but not very often. Pink, yes. Pale blue, yes. Very icy blue, you see. Because the ice blue is the colour that surrounds all bodies that are healthy bodies. Therefore, if you look carefully, you should see this very lovely ice blue colour um, just around the body, very faint indeed, that just closes the body round, and uh, that is the, the, the earth, the body, the bodily water, which is there, and it's very ice blue. There's a reason for it, of course, because it belongs to, the, um, uh, to this uh, physical world. And that's what surrounds it. You know, if you study, the most beautiful thing of all was to read um, that when the, um, the astronauts looked back upon the Earth, they saw it in blue. Did you read that? Yes. They saw it all in blue. That was great. Because we all said, all mediums have said, the Earth, if you know, you go and you can see it, should be in blue. Because that is the colour, you see, that surrounds this earth. But don't mistake it between the blues that have to deal with emotion and to deal with that of which you are... Uh, you see, I'm going on to colour, so we have to be very careful about it. <coughs> but I, all I want to say is that pink is the emotion colour. 
you see it with uh, people, and when you see it with a person, you see them with pink, you know that they are a very highly emotional person, and a person capable of loving. Then you have to find out if they are, they are wanting love to the extreme, and uh, it is the degree by which you see it. Uh, lots of people, you know, they want to love, but they've got a jealous love. And you have to be very careful about that. And you have to be very careful when you have a patient, like a doctor. This is quite true, that you will have some uh, women, um, uh, I don't know whether men fall in love with their lady doctors, but <laughs> women very often fall in love with their doctors. And, but it's the type of person, you see, that we must get. Because you do discover that people can have love to the extreme. And this is shown very much by the degree by which you see uh, these glorious pink colors. Now, I say that because we must understand always what are the life-giving forces. And if you could see yourself, you see, the spiritual colors which are coming into you from the other color are the girl. This is what our friend here is referring to. Um, which is the highest spiritual color, which is coming in from the spiritual planes, uh, to the greens, which come from the etheric planes. So that if you perceive it, first with the aura, which is your mental aura, your physical aura, plus your spiritual aura, plus what is coming into you from the etheric world, and the etheric uh, that is around us, to what is coming into us from the spiritual world, aren't you beautiful? With all those gorgeous colors? Aren't you marvelous? And look what you can make yourself. A blaze of color. An absolute blaze of color. So, you are beautiful. Because you have all these wonderful things happening to you. And it's to put them all in harmony with one another. All the time. So that when we are developing, you develop first of all naturally to be sensitive. But then you have to remember that you yourself must now put yourself in that communion. So you put yourself in that state of communion. Now once you do that, that is you. The spirit world can't do it. You've got to do it. You see, people make a mistake by saying, my guide will do this. They must do this. They must make me do that. They must see that I do this. No, they won't do that. They can't. You've got to do it. That is your development. You've got to learn to put yourself up into that state, spiritual state of reception. So you are receiving. And that must come from you. The spirit world are waiting for you. They're there attracted to you, loving you, wanting you. <laughs> and you then have to lift yourself up to be in tune with them, in every form of mediumship. But when you are healing, you're doing it all the time. Just the same when you're demonstrating. When you're demonstrating, you are putting your mind, linking it up like a bridge between the two worlds. You are, in other words, you are moving into it. And the two are in harmony with one another. In healing, precisely the same thing. You are linking the spirit of the individual up with you into the state of where there is no two worlds but one, completely in harmony with one another. And that's where you get your results. On the spiritual level. On the spiritual level. So therefore, each time that you do healing, give yourself time. Stop for a moment. And remember that you are now going to uh, shake yourself out. You are now going to allow the inner part of you uh, to link up with these great spirits and this greater power of God. And that you've got to be able to learn to feel and to love, to receive and to give. To give. And by so doing, then you get this complete harmony with yourself and the individual. And you know, always remember this, and I said, touched touch on it yesterday, you might think sometimes that you haven't done any good for a person. How do you know? How do you know? 
You have linked them up spiritually. That probably do them far more good than what you were able to could have done physically. And didn't I say to you about the lady that came back and said, although we felt we'd failed with this young lady, in fact, Mr. Thames was quite a, 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 a mad, man, in other words, he just broke down in tears when she passed. And he wasn't going to clean anymore. He felt he'd failed. Until this young lady appeared from the other side and said, you did far more for me than you. <coughs> and that did it. Because here it is. There's your answer. You're linking them up spiritually. And that can't ever be wrong. That can do them far more good than you realize. And if it is that their time has come, that they must leave this earth, you have prepared them for a journey that they are to take that's the most frightening of all. And that is death. And they're no longer afraid. So you can see them. And you see, you can never say, you must remember, that some people, their time has come. But you must never, ever tell them that. Because your job as a healer is to work to them to the very last breath. And never stop. Even though you believe it's hopeless. And never believe it's hopeless. There's no such thing as a hopeless case. Never a hopeless case. Now, uh, the, the other thing that I want to stress to you, and which we were having a, a lecture about it, and that was diet. Now, when we talk about diet, I'm not talking about the diet to reduce. I'm talking about the diet of food, and the correct type of food, and also, um, the times of when you should fast, and the times of when you shouldn't, and the preparation of yourself as a healer, uh, to give yourself uh, the opportunity of being emptied physically and filled spiritually. You should never uh, try to heal on a full time. <coughs> You should always, if you're going to heal, is to have a midday meal, and if you want a midday meal, and then if you're going to heal in the evenings, not to go and have a heavy meal, and then to start to heal. What you should do is to have your um, afternoon meal, and take your meal after all your work is done. Now I say this because I find in demonstrations of clairvoyance or in mediumship, that if I have a full stomach, I don't, I'm never able to give my best. And I always find after the meeting anyway, uh, that I can eat. So therefore, I always work it that I have my meal after I finished. And I think you need a meal after you finished, in any case. So therefore, um, go quietly on your food the day you are going to heal, and then arrange to have your meal Follow me when you go to um, Now, there are fours and against this idea of food and diet and vegetarianism. But I think you'll find that when you come up against certain illnesses, uh, that you will receive that the person should die. For example, I think during the, the, some of the people that I've diagnosed, on two occasions, I've had to tell the people that they must fast. But that was because they had a particular illness of where fasting is necessary. So therefore, you may occasionally get that, that they should fast and they should diet. If you feel that, and uh, the illness that you feel that they've got tells you that there is something that that digestion or food is necessary, that it should not be so heavy, then say so. And just try to get them to come over. For example, all uh, rheumatic cases and um, all arthritis cases um, should go off red meats because we know for a fact, I mean, it's now established that people that are arthritis cases should rarely be vegetarian because it's been proved that people benefit by being vegetarians if they are arthritis cases. Now, if you go that far, you also know that in certain heart conditions, uh, that there are certain foods that they shouldn't take. 
The doctors won't come right out of it, but I think that they're leaning over to the idea that their food does play a great part, and therefore we should rather tend to think about it. We've had lost someone here that was going to talk about it. The only thing is that you have to be very careful because you can go the wrong way. For example, we have a gentleman here whose wife has gone on to a very strict diet and now she really has an illness caused by going to the extreme. You can go to the extreme. In fact, there's a case um, in the paper a little while ago where one gentleman who was a doctor decided to go on nothing else but carrot juice and take nothing else but carrot juice and he died through carrot juice. And killed him. So you see, you must be careful of what you're saying. And uh, although carrot juice may be suitable for one, it may not always be suitable for another. So we really need specialists. To those that are going to feel, I do suggest that you do try this method of watching the food on the day that you heal. One very good thing about coming about the, the um, uh, Philippine healers, which I think is extraordinary uh, wonderful, is the fact that every one of these healers went on a fast before they went to healing. And they didn't know why they did it, but they were asked, some of them were farmers, some of them were just peasants, some of them didn't have other work. But all they had a call, and they went way into the mountains and went on a fast. And when they came back, they found they had this power. Now we have to think about this. We realize that they're in a different country to ours, the climate is different, the conditions are different, but it does appear in their case that it helped them uh, to find this mystic approach to life. And we are told by uh, mystics uh, that we should fast and that we should fast for a reason. Now, we have to be careful because I do know people that have fasted and that they've been very ill. As a matter of fact, we had two gentlemen here um, last year who went on a fast and went on a fast for four days and we had to fetch the doctors to them because they went the reverse. So that you do have to be careful uh, that, and it was unfortunate that we had to fetch in the doctor. I was not here, but I know the doctor was fetched in. And uh, some person told them to fast, and obviously it wasn't the wisest thing for them. Uh, there is a calling, there are certain people that can fast and certain people that can't. Uh, for example, Mr. Thames can't fast, he only has to go a day without food, he just faints. He can't go without food. So it's no use saying to him fast, because he just says, I can't. Now whether it's the mind or what it is, I just don't know, but he just, there are people that just can't do without food. And um, although I'm quite sure you can overcome it, I think it's very much in the mind. On the other hand, it's no use causing trouble. It has to be done carefully. And I have always suggested to people that there are places that you can go where you are under correct supervision. There's one wonderful place very close to here, at Newport Pagnon, uh, which is a wonderful place, which is a health center, where they have healers there, spiritual healers, and uh, where they uh, accept spiritualism and accept spiritualism and the majority of them are. And there are doctors and people who are working together and that they put people on a fast, uh, but they, they are watching the patient all the time and sometimes after two days they take them off it because they realize it's not doing them the good that they want it and they gradually break it in that way. So when we talk about it, don't just go and say, well, I'm going to be like a Philippine healer and go 48 days without food, just living on water, because it might kill you. <laughs> and therefore, it has to be a calling. I wanted to say that to you, so as to clear that up. Now, are there any questions, first of all, up to now that you want to ask and get over, so if we can answer them? The question was asked, what should you do if you feel drained after giving healing? I was told of a case uh, a little while ago where the, the husband felt standing by a person completely drained. Yes. Yes. And I had to refer back, of course, to Jesus when they touched the hem of his garment. 
dream. That was a wonderful. I, I, I love to talk about him because uh, he had such a marvelous life. Our medium show, and uh, he was dreaming, and he just stood still for a moment, and it all came back. Now he didn't always come back straight away. Uh, I find that um, after sales, for example, I'm terribly drained. But if after I just do the right thing and I just do what I'm supposed to do, I just take a, a, a very hot cup of tea with plenty of sugar in it, and uh, sit down quietly and go and lie down, and it's only for half an hour. After that half an hour, I'm nearly back to normal. Not quite normal, but nearly back to normal. Now, at one time, it took me two or three hours to begin to feel normal, you know. Now, I can do it in probably half an hour to an hour, because you do the right thing. But with healing, I think lots of people are inclined to get, go through their healing, and then when it's all over, uh, I never rush away. I always feel that you must sit down quietly, and then afterwards, sort of chew yourself back into the spirit. If it's only for 10 minutes and just half up, it's all over, you'll be amazed how it all begins to pull back. You see? Because it's got to come back, because you've given so much out. And you see, you must tune back in to this um, uh, wonderful rhythm of life with all these wonderful powers that are around us. We've got to be able to put ourselves in to receive. So where you learn to give, you now, after it's all over, put yourself up and just bathe yourself in it. Feel it coming in, you see? And you do it, you do it. Train yourself to be able to just bring it back in. And after five minutes, you think, I can start all over again. <laughs> you don't, of course, but you could. You see what I mean? It's a question of doing it, giving it, getting it back. But you must tune yourself back to be able to do it. The question was asked, should you pull back from healing in your later years, or if you have health problems? My mother's 86, and um, we have to occasionally fetch the doctor, because she has a bad leg, and we insist, because the only time we can get her to stop working is by saying, look, we're fetching the doctor. And she said, I don't want the doctor. Well, you're going to have the doctor, because we're going to have you put in bed if you're not careful. And the doctor comes in, and she says, I know he's going to say to him, and he comes to the door and says, well, Mrs. Hingston, you are 86. <laughs> That's all his body says to her. And she always says, yes, I know, doctor, I'm 86, and I know it's me age. <laughs> and it's always the answer she gets, you see. And he just says, all you can do is rest. And she'll say, well, you know, doctor, the trouble is that if I'm an invalid, I might as well go over to the spirit world now. While I'm here, I must work. And that's true. That is true. We must work while we're here. Because there's nothing worse than giving yourself up and saying, well, I'm too old. You're never too old. Never too old. And it's exactly the same as uh, people are saying, if you're sick, can you heal? Because even if you're 90, 100, you can heal. The question was asked, should you remain with the same healer, or can you go to other healers? It doesn't matter how many healers you go to. The question that you shouldn't go to another healer is all wrong. <coughs> you should be able to go to any healer, and they should all be able to do you good. I've always laid down in my own church that you must never just cling to one healer. You always find that certain people appear to do you more good than another. But we should not sort of say, oh, I'm not going to take you if you go to her, or I'm not going to take you if you go to him. I have patients that I recommend go to other healers, because I think that if we're doing a healing, we should work together. And the idea is that we must always be prepared to work together, because, after all, we should work together. Um, and once we do that, then we don't... The only thing that I would say uh, about this is that if you know uh, that... I mean, I know that there are certain people that go probably to certain healers, and I'm not too keen about the way in which these healers work. Um, I would be uh, uh, say, well, you know, I'm not so sure you're, you're probably doing the right thing. I don't prepare. If you feel that you're doing better with that patient, with this that healer, I think you should remain under them. Uh, rather, you know, say, well, you go with them and see how you go on. Uh, because you can't always, some people can undo some of the work that you're doing, uh, but you must know, you know, be sure of the type of thing that they're doing. 
you're talking about patients going to Harry Edwards or to Mr. Prickers or to George Chapman's or people of that caliber, uh, you know that they will do them good rather than harm. If you're talking about people that are continually telling people to take certain herbs and this sort of thing, one always has to be rather careful. Uh, as long as the person is a specialist and they know what they're doing, you can't go very far wrong. 